Uh, welcome everyone to my presentation. I'm Khaled Sabah, PhD student at the University of Gothenburg. Uh, in my PhD, I've been focusing, my research focus has been mainly on optimizing test case selection using machine learning. And today's presentation, I'm going to give you some background information about the selection approach that me and my colleagues, Miroslav and Regina Habek, uh, have been jointly working uh, on investigating its usage and implementation. Now I'm also going to talk to you about the results of a controlled experiment that we carried out to investigate the effects of one type of noise called class noise on the performance of the test case selection method. So I'll start my presentation with a diagram that illustrates testing in continuous integration. So typically in a continuous integration pipeline, we have a code base that is maintained by version control uh, system and we have auto-generated builds. Uh, that are created at specific time intervals, where each build includes a compilation of the code check-ins pushed by developers to different branches. Uh, and then as soon as, as the code check-ins get compiled, a build is created, and then a number of test cases get executed in order to regressively verify that the system under test or the behavior of the system under test has not been adversely affected by the new changes. And more and more increasingly, companies these days are adopting the practice of test continuous testing and continuous integration for myriads of reasons, as you may know, one of which is uh, its promises for a high quality software program uh, to the end users community at minimal efforts and time. Because the earlier we manage to identify faults and fix them, the less costly it becomes uh, in the development for the project. However, the practice of continuous integration and testing becomes challenging when the system under test grows in size and complexity, because as the system grows in size, so does the amount of test cases required to be executed uh, do. And over time, the cost of executing those test cases uh, becomes a bottleneck in terms of, of how much they hamper the development velocity of developers and, uh, and how much hardware resources uh, are needed to, to run those tests. And for that reason, companies often organize their test suites in different forms of varying sizes. We have a full scope, which includes all the tests, uh, and those are often run over weekends. And we have a smaller uh, test suite, which is uh, a subset of the, of, the, of the pool of tests, which is also executed overnight on a daily basis. And we also have a minimal suite type, which has the smallest amount of test cases, and that's executed after a build is, is created. Uh, uh, and and here the subset of test cases in this minimal suite is selected based on different criteria depending on what test case selection approach is being used. So um, the idea is that we want to include in this subset of test cases, uh, uh, test cases that have high fault revealing capabilities such that we identify faults as soon as they're introduced and we don't wait until later stages. <clears throat> Yeah, so if we could analyze the code that were previously pushed uh, by developers and try to find a statistical dependency between that code and the execution result of test cases that were run against the code, uh, then maybe we can increase the chances of finding an effective subset of test cases in those minimal suites and only include test cases uh, that will fail and exclude test cases that will pass. And this is actually the fundamental idea behind the approach that we came up with. We call the approach MeBots, which stands for Method Using Bag of Words for Test Case Selection. Um, and our approach is, is basically to employ a machine learning model, a supervised machine learning model that gets trained on historical code changes and test execution results. Uh, and in hope that the model will be able to classify which lines of the code will trigger a test case failure and a test case pass. Uh, and for all those test cases that are predicted to fail, we'll include in the in the suites. So the first step of the method is about extracting code changes from history logs in version control system and the test execution results from different data stores. And the next step is to uh, feed those extracted code changes into a feature extraction algorithm to convert to convert uh, the input code into some feature vectors that we can use in step three for training a machine learning model. So, um, 
Then we walk you through a small example to illustrate how each step in the method works. So in the first step of the method, in the method, as I said, we start by extracting code changes, but the extraction of those changes uh, uh, is made between consecutive pairs of revisions. Okay, so if we have revision one, revision two in this example, we uh, extract the differences between revision one and revision two. Now, suppose that we have this code fragment in revision one, and this code fragment was modified later in revision two to look something like this, then what we would be interested in extracting are only code lines that were added from revision one to revision two. And once we do that, we go and, ex and extract, randomly extract or select uh, an execution result of a test case that was run against revision two. And in this example, C1 failed um, in the execution. So we use a value of zero to uh, represent a failing test case and a value of one to represent a passing test case. And we take that value, the execution result of the test case, and we label each line of the extracted code change with that value. <clears throat> so in the next step of the method, now we um, we feed the extracted code changes from step one into a feature extraction algorithm. We Here we use the bag of word approach, which is a statistical based approach that uses a frequency count of occurrences of each token in the in the in the input code. So if you look at the first uh, line here, int main, int rc, and you look at the equivalent representation using bag of words, we notice that the token int comes with the count of two because it occurred twice in this line, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now we've generated the feature vectors and we're ready to feed those feature vectors into the uh, machine learning model, and that's step three in the method. But before we do that, we have to be cautious about the quality of the data we have uh, for training. So we need to ask ourselves, like, okay, um, how much does this data come with noise? And if it does, then how much impact will it have on, on the classification performance of, of the model for training? And when I talk about noise, I refer to anything in the data that can obscure the classification performance. And some examples can be having similar entries in the data set that comes with different uh, class values. We could also be using some measurement uh, tools that produces uh, erroneous measurements in the attributes in the class. So we could also even have empty uh, values in the attributes in the class. Uh, but, but let's take a closer look at the first example. Suppose we have two printf statements that are exactly the same, and then we feed those into um, the feature extraction algorithm. The representation will look exactly similar, but they have different class values. So if we refer to those instances in the data set as contradictory because they're exactly identical, but they have different class labels. Uh, and we, we, we calculate the ratio of their occurrences to the total number of entries we have, and we refer to that ratio as class noise ratio. So um, the purpose of a study that we've recently conducted was to examine the effects of having such uh, noise in the data on, on the performance of uh, a learner for test case selection. Uh, and for that purpose, we designed and implemented a controlled experiment using historical code changes and test execution results for a program written in the C language. And the only independent variable we had was class noise, which was examined for an effect on four dependent variables, which were precision, recall, F-score, and Matthew correlation coefficient, or MCC. Um, and to support the investigation of, of, of the goal, we needed to have a baseline group or a control group uh, in order to, to seed uh, noise at various levels and then to compare statistically compare the effect of the seeded noise on the performance um, of the model. So we use six variation of noise in this study. We used 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 40, 50 and 60%. And then we compare the performance score of, of a predictor for test case selection under each level uh, with the rest. Okay, and the data we used belong to a software telecommunication company, uh, uh, and the program was written in the C language. We worked with 246,850 lines initially, and those, um, and also for 82 test execution results that belong to 12 test cases. Yeah, so the first step was we needed to construct this control group. Uh, as I said, this control group needs to come with 0% class noise level so that we can see variation of class noise and uh, examine their effect on the performance. 
So I'm going to explain the algorithm that we uh, we followed for that. Uh, so what we did was we randomly picked two line vectors from each of the binary classes in the generated feature space from the back and forth approach. That was the first step. And then the next step, we uh, compared this baseline vector with the remaining vectors in each class. So for the baseline vector that was selected from the uh, uh, past class or from the one class, we compared that for a similarity in orientation with the remaining vectors uh, using cosine similarity. And using some trial and error approach, we, we, uh, we selected 95% as a threshold for similarity uh, in orientation because when we tested the performance using this th threshold of, of, uh, for a predictor, it yielded almost 100% for all the four dependent variables we have. So we ended up at the end uh, with a control group of size 9,330 uh, line vectors. And after building the control groups, we needed to generate the experimental subjects in which we will seed the noise. Um, and for that purpose, we used stratified cross-validation with K equals 15 on the control group. And then we seeded one variation level of noise into each of those subjects and each subject contains 622 observations. For evaluating the effect of those variations on the performance of a predictive model for test case selection, we used a random forest uh, model uh, and recorded its precision, the four dependent variables, precision, recall, X-score, and MCC at each level of class noise. And then the results showed us that there was a downward trend. The more we went up in seeding class noise, there was a downward trend in performance uh, across the four uh, dependent variables. Uh, and with an exception for the recall, which, which showed a downward trend when the noise level exceeded 30%. Okay, and then we did a statistical test to compare whether those results um, uh, uh, are significant, you know, if there is a significant in, uh, in those performance scores. And we did find a significance. We're running uh, a statistical tests with an exception for the recalls I said, which showed significance when the, when the noise level exceeded 30%. So. so what the result told us as well is that with the higher, the higher class noise we have in the data, the more the learner got or became biased towards the past class which means that we will miss out test cases. We'll be more optimistic about uh, whether test cases will pass or not. It will say that they will pass. And then if we exclude those passing tests, we will end up missing out tests in the suite, which are important to uh, reveal uh, faults. And also what the results told us that when the, as I said, when class noise went above 30%, then uh, there will be more false alarms about failed tests. So it will be more pessimistic. Uh, and therefore leads to including tests that will not uh, fail. As a practical recommendations for testers who want to use the method, we recommend them to uh, check or uh, at least not use the data for uh, predict for test case selection unless a class noise is handled or un unless a class noise was below 30%. And if it was above that, then they can uh, they need to handle the, the noise beforehand. And if the noise level was below 10%, then probably don't need to bother about uh, handling class noise in the data. Yeah, so in conclusion, we did provide this uh, formula um, for calculating noise in the data, which can help testers to estimate the efforts required uh, and the impact uh, that class noise can have at various levels on the prediction of uh, test cases using our approach. And what we also want to do in the future is to study the impact or the effect of having of, of attribute noise, which is another type of noise. In this study, we, we examined the class noise. I want to study how uh, the attribute noise affects the performance as well. Um, and we would also want to create a taxonomy, and that's an invitation to everyone here, who can hear. We want to also create a taxonomy for uh, illustrating the relationship between code changes and test case reaction, different types of test case, test cases that can react to different code changes. So, yeah. I think I finished uh, five minutes early, so 